and we should also have our YouTube folks joining us now too. So welcome folks who are on Zoom and we're just getting started up now. And today we're using a web webinar uh, Zoom, which means that you attendees, uh, if you have any uh, problems or things that you wanted to share with people, you can put that in chat. But there's also a QA function this time. And so we would like you, if you have any questions that you want panelists to answer or presenters to answer, type them into the QA, not into the chat. But you're welcome to use the chat um, just to send comments. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Vivian New, the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS. And I also happen to be our nursery manager. And I'm really excited and also exhausted uh, getting ready for our fall plant sale. But this, that is what we're doing today. And we're especially excited because we have figured out how to have a joint sale with Grassroots, our historic partner, our beloved historic partner. And so uh, we also have Grassroots, Diana Giuliano from Grassroots here today uh, to, to kick off our sale. And so from our perspective, immediately after the session, our online store is going to go live, but Deanna's store is already live and uh, all that information, we'll share that again with you today as uh, we go through the session so that you can start shopping as soon as we're done uh, explaining on and showing and sharing all this wonderful information we have for you. So good morning and welcome. Um, but first I'm going to just do a little bit of the usual um, overview of what our chapter has coming up. And this next week, we've got a, our photography group meeting. Should be a lot of fun. I know our one of our past presidents, Steve Rosenthal, is planning to join and he has some really amazing pictures of bees and other pollinators that he's been taking as we've been quarantined. And so I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. So even if you don't have any photos to share, it's definitely worth stopping in on Wednesday, October 14th at seven. Um, we also have a program meeting coming up at the, on October 21st with the state offices, Julie Evans. And she's gonna be talking about CNPS, CNPS's vegetation program and um, the California's botanical landscapes. And then at the end of the month, we have Amit Zaveri, who is a, an amazing photographer. He goes all over the Bay Area taking pictures of both the flora and fauna. And his talk is gonna actually focus more on the fauna part um, of the Bay Area. And that one's bound to be a lot of fun too. So please join us and uh, stay tuned because we do have other events coming up too. And uh, if you, don't know, if you're not on our news list, I strongly encourage joining because that's the way you find out about all this fun stuff and other interesting things going on by the chapter. We only send about one message a week, just letting you know what's coming up. So if you're not already on, I highly recommend joining. It's a Google group. You can send email to the address on the screen and you can also find that information on our website, cnps-scv.org. And uh, this is why we're here, it's the fall plant sale. Um, this is a, a little old, the slide, it doesn't mention grassroots, but grassroots is, is here today and uh, you can spend your week buying plants online from both of our nurseries. And then on Saturday, next Saturday, you can pick your plants up. You can come by Hidden Villa first, or you can go up to Foothill Park where grassroots is located and pick your plants up there and drive down the hill, or you can, drive up the hill if you come to our nursery first, but we're pretty close and it's beautiful in both locations. So I hope you buy plants from both of us. Uh, and if you're enjoying our talks and you like playing with Zoom, 
we could use more help. So uh, if you're, you'd like to be a moderator or a co-host, or if you uh, like playing with YouTube videos and are willing to help us do some of the editing for our videos, we would love to talk to you. So please get in touch. Um, you can contact uh, Johanna Kwan, who is our vice president, or Madeline Morrow, who is our past president and also here with us today. She's the chair of our plant sale. So she's the one doing all the organization um, for the pickup next week. And as I mentioned before, we are using the webinar Zoom today, which is a bit different than the, the standard Zoom. If you notice down there on the, the bottom of your Zoom um, bar, where you have the controls and it normally has the chat, well, today you should also see um, a little icon for Q&A. If you have questions, um, please at any point in time, type them into the QA rather than the chat, which is what we've typically been doing with our past presentations. But the QA feature is nice because it lets us keep each question separate and we will be monitoring the QA. And so in some cases, um, if we can, we'll answer them on the fly in the QA box. But what we're gonna do today is collect all those questions up and um, rather than having the session, the, the answer session, immediately after each presentation, we will hold them all because we're gonna have a panel discussion at the end and we'll take all the QA then. So please go ahead and share your questions at any point during the presentation, during the whole session, but just be aware that we're gonna actually actively be answering them in person at the end. And then um, finally, if you're not currently a member of CNPS, we would love to have you join. Uh, there's uh, the advantage of being a member is that you support our state organization in addition to the chapters. And the state does a, a lot of additional things beyond just what our chapter has. And if you've ever used CalScape, for example, that is something that's done by our state office. And uh, we do a lot of work um, just conserving California's uh, biodiversity and pre preserving rare plants. There's just so much work that CNPS does and it really helps if you're a member. So please consider joining if you're not already. And so I'm gonna, um, so today actually we have three different presenters. Um, there's Chris who's going to be doing his planting demo. We're doing our best actually to provide the same kinds of things we do if we were together live. And if you've been to our fall plant sale before, you may have seen Chris doing a demonstration of the way he does planting for native plants, the mud method. It's a great way to plant native plants. It, it's very successful. So he's gonna be doing that first. He's got uh, virtually for you. And then Deanna's gonna tell you a little bit about her nursery. In fact, she is joining us from her nursery at Foothill Park. And then I'm gonna wrap up the uh, video presentation part um, with a tour of our nursery. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and he will go ahead and, and show you how to plant native plants. Are you ready, Chris? Okay. Hey, Vivian, you need to make me a co-host so I can start the oh, video. Oh, sorry. Just a sec. Because right now I, uh, I'm unable to start the video until... Okay, now I, can, now I can start video and I can share the screen with my planting method. Uh, the, okay, let me double check where, which one it is. Okay, this one here. Okay, before I start playing the uh, video, I must mention that we had a little bit of a technical problems and the uh, voice on the video is rather uh, soft. So uh, when the, you have the video is playing, you may want to turn your speakers uh, higher and then uh, turn them back lower after the video is done so that uh, the voice that you hear now is not going to be overwhelming. Um, so with this warning, uh, I'm going to start the video right now and I'm going to mute myself and everybody else.
Chris, there's no sound. Uh, it looks like we had a problem. I started the, the it looks like some the sound is not coming from the video. I'm going to restart it and my apology for the problem. Just a second. All right, let me start sharing again, this time with, with, uh, with sound. Oh, this this was this was a forgot to I forgot to click the the proper button. Sorry about that. Mm. Uh. Oh, bye bye bye. Just a moment. Now, now I can't seem to be able to share anything. Yeah, just a sec. Okay, back to the beginning when I started talking. Okay, and this time there should be sound. It to be a demo of planting in mud. This is the method I've been using for oh almost 20 years now and I get pretty good success with with this uh, it generally you know 95 percent uh, survives. This is the same method that is used in Italy to plant grapevines which is a little bit interesting it just means I didn't invent it it it's just independent discovery of the same thing but uh, the easy thing about it is that it requires real, fairly little effort. Uh, the, the hole that I dig is just barely bigger than the pot. I use the this, this here is my standard planting tool. And in this case, it's going to be, the hole is going to be dug, dug in here. Uh, the building department, because this is used for mixing small amounts of concrete. And it's also perfect to, 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 to play with mud. And of course, for playing with mud, the thing to do is really you need to soak it. Uh, well, you need to give it a good soaking with water. I'm using five gallon. Uh, buckets like this next, next to the arrow the hole is small so i i always label this thing with sixty fourth of, of an inch anything bigger and it's going to empty too fast and for for heavy clay one sixty one sixteenth is probably the, the right size because it will drain this pot in about four to five hours uh, so the, the, the water will slowly percolate down the clay and, and will make the entire thing much easier to dig. The first thing to do is to dig a hole, dump the existing soil in, in the concrete mixer pan. Here we have very good soil that is very nice and it's not well like what I have to deal with in, in my garden in San Jose where it's just basically very heavy clay. So so at this point what I normally would do if I was didn't have the area already well prepared it would go something like this fill it with water, leave it for, for a couple of hours, uh, probably fill it again. Generally what I do, I do this the day before I'm going to start planting. So it's, sometimes I do it two, two nights in a row. So one night, I, one evening I let one bucket of water drip down. The second evening I do the second and the, the, the third day I, I go into planting. 
um, you can do per day with this method. Well, still, it's it's the, the, the results are good enough to justify this kind of uh, uh, time spending on it. Okay, now the, the important thing that I will be showing is how to prepare the root ball for planting. Basically, the idea is that if you plant a nice nicely grown plant like this one it hitting top of this of the of the surface to air it acts a little bit like a wick so in the summer the water is going to come up through the root ball and evaporate and in winter you end up actually the water pouring in and drowning the plant so in clay in in, in heavy soils what i do is i wash off about two inches of the top of the root ball and dump it with the native soil. I also wash off about an inch on the sides. And once this is done, uh, I may need to add some more water to, to the soil that I dug up and then make it into the mud, pour the mud down the hole, plunk the, uh, put, put the plant down the mud just be, it, be a little careful, especially if it has roots that don't like too much disturbance. This is a fermentodendron which doesn't really look uh, like for the dis uh, disturbance of the roots. Um, but I planted a number of them and they are doing fine in exactly the same way. So get this thing out of the pot. Oh, and this one, oh, this, this, we, this we have a problem. This is not ready for planting. Let's see how this guy, yeah, this one guy has plenty of roots. So this, this is an ideal plant on which to demo the method. Let me show on this one what I would normally do with uh, regarding the washing of the soil. It's a shower head that has position called center and this produces several streams like that so this is perfect for washing things off i would actually grab it put put it maybe like this What we have here now is the top, about, I would say, an inch and a half got uh, washed off. We have exposed the roots, but that's okay. They are going to be covered with mud in a, you know, as soon as I plant it. And the sides of the, of the root ball are also washed off. Well, maybe they need a little bit more, actually. The roots at the bottom probably need to be teased out. And even sometimes cutting them also works. The, what I use is I have this soil knife and basically what you can try to do is pull the roots out. It will break some of them but most of them are going to survive so it's not a big deal. Getting a little bit of shower here. I'm just going to play with it until it looks about right. Okay, this is about the consistency that I want. I still, I'm still trying to work this water into the mud so that it's not excessively runny. Okay, this hopefully will be enough. Let me try again. The consistency that I like to have. Okay, so there we have a nice mound of mud that is not exactly runny. Then this is something that I would do regardless of what the plant. Cup the 
plant in your hands and dump it where it should be. So, because right now it's, it's very easy for it to get blown sideways. Mistake. I don't want it to be too close. This looks good to me. It should be should be okay after we tie it to the stake. Hopefully it will survive. I have had experiences like this with some other plants. Uh, most notably I planted a manzanita that was probably even worse in a worse shape than this guy. It definitely was not ready for planting. It was just moved from a three inch pot into one gallon. And there was virtually no, no roots outside the three inch diameter and it's doing perfectly fine. And I added a little bit of soil that I grabbed from somewhere nearby, actually from 10 feet away. And I uh, dumped it into my mixing pan before uh, digging the hole. And this allows me to plant the, 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 this little fermentodendron a little bit higher than it would normally be. It doesn't need to be tied up very tightly. Something close to the close to the stake that will let it still move around in the wind so that it will actually have an incentive to grow stiffer stem. Something like this should be okay. And ideally, I don't want this thing to move down so i'm going to tie it a little bit more tightly to the stake so that yeah something like that so now now the the tape is in the right place it doesn't interfere with the leaf it doesn't interfere with anything else looks looks basically good Planting is to mulch and mulch a lot. You know, two, three inches of mulch is always helpful. So let's just grab whatever was there before and cover it, but skip it a little bit away from the stem, of course. So there should be some space of regular mud that you see around about two three inches at this point should be enough and i think this that's that's more or less it All right, so this was uh, my planting in mud method. <laughs> uh, I wanted also to show uh, a couple of pictures of plants uh, that, that uh, like this method of planting, because I think that this would be the first question is, uh, what plants respond well to this, uh, to this uh, method? And for this, I have a slideshow that will take probably another 10 minutes or so. I hope not longer than this. Uh, let me just go and find the window where I have it. Uh, just a moment. Okay, got it. And now let me share it. There it goes. Go to the beginning and start the slideshow. All right, I hope it's showing up okay. 
Uh, this is an example of what happens. Oh, let, let's go back to the previous one. Uh, that's an example of what sometimes happens. Uh, sometimes the soil is uh, so uh, fine that it washes off very easily, and I effectively have berooted this plant. This was the gold current Ribis aureum and back in 2003 when I made my first documentation of this method. At this point, I've been using it for a couple of years already, and I thought it would be a good idea to, to document it. Uh, this is the same Ribis, the same current after 15 years in the ground. Uh, I have maintained it uh, by occasionally cutting it back severely because it wants to grow much bigger than it is and it was planted in a slightly wrong place. So it needs a little bit more maintenance that, uh, than otherwise, but it's perfectly healthy after those 15 years and it's actually spreading around the place uh, underground by roots. Uh, here is uh, another example of from 2003. I have just started planting my backyards and uh, this one shows a couple of cyanotus. There is a couple of manzanita uh, in, in this place. And this is uh, again, 17 years ago. And the manzanitas that, uh, that you have seen in the, or maybe you, you had the difficulty seeing in the, in the previous slide, in this one, they are now fully mature after 13 years blooming. So this, this is the spring from a couple of years ago. I didn't have a good picture from this year, so I used the one from, I think this is from 2016. Uh, another change uh, that, that can be, that uh, was affected by planting in mud, uh, everything that, uh, that uh, you will see in this area uh, was planted uh, using this method. Uh, this is uh, September 1st, 2002, when I started thinking about actually doing something with my backyard. Uh, about half a year later, it's been uh, cleaned up. Uh, I have uh, uh, water pipe going down the, the, so that I can you have the water for watering the new plantings. And there are a couple of plants here. That, that I wanted to mention. There is a uh, Fremont poplar. It's in the, the upper, in the right corner of the property. Uh, so you, it's about uh, halfway the, the size of the picture and all the way to the right. And there are a couple of other things. There's a uh, uh, Arroyo Willow planted. There's another Fremont poplar. There is uh, California uh, Laurel. And this is the same view that uh, that was taken uh, about a year ago in summer. The poplar is now 60 feet tall. This is this big tree on the right. The other poplar is a little bit lower. It's only 40 feet. And the reason is that the one on the right, that this big, huge uh, tree has found, uh, the, managed to, to find the groundwater because it was planted about six feet lower elevation than the one on the left. The one on the left took a couple of years before its uh, roots reached the groundwater and now it's uh, taking off and picking up the pace. It's going to be probably 60 feet tall in another couple of years. Uh, I wanted to also show a couple of examples of, of plants that respond well to this planting. A lot of manzanitas, like for, for example, the popular uh, cultivars of um, Arctostaphylos densiflora, uh, they take very well to this type of planting. This is the cultivar called Harmony, which is very similar to Howard McMean, except it grows a little bit lower. This one is about four feet tall. There are two Howard McMeans on the left and right uh, behind the Harmony that uh, are about five or six feet tall by now. This is an 11-year-old plant. Uh, another one that is uh, also responding well is uh, Chamis adenostoma fasciculatum. Uh, this is the one that is a little bit flammable, so it shouldn't be planted too close to the houses. Uh, one more that, that likes this method of planting is Artemisia californica. This is locally native. You can see it on the hills all over the Bay Area. Uh, salt bush, Atriplex lentiformis. Uh, this is not strictly locally native, but it, it likes uh, the climate here and grows very well with no water. And this one is uh, was planted uh, oh, back in 2003. The picture, this photo is from 2005. 
Uh, Cyanotus. Most of the Cyanotus respond very well to this planting method. Uh, this one shows Cyanotus concha after four years in the ground. And behind it, you have Fremontodendron. There are two Fremontodendrons on the left are California Glory. The other one uh, behind is uh, Pacific Sunset. And there's also a little bit of Pacific Sunset showing up from the right. They were all planted the same way. Uh, Cyanotus popcorn, that's another example of a Cyanotus. Uh, this one is after five years in the ground. Uh, mountain mahogany, Cercocarpus betuloides. Uh, that's another wonderful plant that uh, works well in our area and in clay soil. This one after 13 years old, it's about nine feet tall, I would say. It's slow growing unless you water it a little bit more than I do, and I don't water it at all. Deer grass. Uh, responds very well. This one is four years old, it has never received any water after the first year. And there's a couple of cyanotus around planted at the same time. Those are four years old, uh, never watered after the first year in the ground. Uh, buckwheats. buckwheats. Most buckwheats respond well. The uh, Eriogonum fasciculatum, uh, the, the popular California buckwheat that is locally native, works fine. Uh, Eriogonum giganteum, which is St. Catherine's Lace. Uh, this one is from South California, but works well in our area as well and doesn't need any water. This one is the variety called uh, Eriogonum giganteum compactum. Uh, it grows much slower than the regular uh, St. Catherine's Lace, uh, and it grow, grows only about two feet tall. This one, after 11 years, is maybe six feet across. So it's a good plant for smaller gardens that want buckwheats and it's also a pollinator attractant. Uh, the brittle bush in Celia Californica, uh, this one was planted in mud. It, this, this I remember, this was the plant that was also very stressed and had very little roots. And this photo here shows it uh, half a year after planting. Uh, Fremontodendrons do reasonably well as well. This one shows two plantings of Fremontodendron Eldorado Gold. This is the hybrid of uh, Fremontodendron decumbens with uh, Pacific Sunset, I believe. And uh, this was planted back in 2003 after 17 years. It's uh, still doing perfectly well. Uh, Gambelia speciosa is another plant uh, that, that I like for our area. Uh, this one shows the picture from 2003 or maybe 2004. This was after it was one year in the ground after planting. And this shows what it is now. It becomes a monster. And this one is probably about 15 feet long and six feet across. And I have to prune it every year because it's trying to take over the house. Toyon, another local native planting, uh, also responds well to planting in the mud. This is a specimen that is 13 years old and there is Cyanotus dark star in front of it. And there's another Yankee point in front of that one, but not blooming. Uh, the rare plant to, to find Isocoma menziesi. This is one of the plants that bloom in the fall. This is the picture taken about 10 days ago. It's uh, overgrown its space. I need to rejuvenate it by cutting it down. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can barely see, but there are some yellow flowers uh, at, the, at the top of those leaning stalks. Um, and uh, it's always, uh, you know, attracting pollinators. Uh, mallows uh, work well with the, this planting method. This is Malocotamnus fasciculatus. Uh, this one is actually fairly aggressive, so it needs to be planted in a place where it can either uh, be allowed to spread by roots or, uh, or you can control it in some other way. Uh, the Prunus ilicifolia, that's, that's uh, another of uh, plant that I like and it works. Uh, it's very versatile. If you don't water it, it grows very slowly. This one is 16 years old and it's probably nine feet tall. With watering, it grows much faster and can, re obtain, can reach much bigger sizes. Uh, that's the gray pine, our locally native, six years in the ground, also planted in mud. Oh, the, the Fremont poplar that I was talking about before, this is a uh, photo of the trunk after 13 years in the ground. This is a super vigorous plant. I can see it, it's right now. It's probably about two and a half to three feet thick trunk 
this measuring uh, uh, this measure that is at the bottom is four feet long. So this gives you the scale of how big this thing is. And of course, it's 60 feet tall, as I mentioned. Uh, oaks respond perfectly fine to planting a method. This is the Canyon Oak Quercus chrysolepis after 17 years old with no watering at all after planting. Uh, the currants respond well to this type of planting. This one is Ribis in the Corum, which is important. It's, it's not our local native, but it's uh, it's a uh, I think it's called chaparral currant. Uh, and this one was after 10 years old was was uh, very happy. Uh, oh, uh, the Rus species, Rus integrifolia and Rus ovata, which is sugar bush and lemonade berry. Those respond extremely well to this planting and I've never lost any of them. I have uh, uh, probably about a dozen of them, maybe more uh, growing in the backyard and all of them are happy. Uh, again, this is plant that requires no watering. Uh, salvia, most of the salvias respond well to planting in mud. This is an example of the desert purple sage, salvia dorii. This is the, this, the sage that actually deserves being called purple, as you can see by the color flower of the, uh, by the flower color. Uh, salvia munziae, that's another example, 16 years in the ground. This is the most drought tolerant of all salvias. It looks dead in the summer and then it takes about a week after the rain start for it to become green and then a little bit later it starts showing the flowers. Uh, and I think this is the end for me. So that's that's the end of my presentation. So I'm going to turn it back to Madeline. Uh, actually, it's me. <laughs> Hi, Chris. So thank you very much for that. Really, that was amazing. And someday you will have to do a whole session, a GNGT session on your garden because it's it's a, such a wonderful place. Um, at this point, uh, our next uh, presenter is Deanna, who's going to be speaking to us from her nursery up at Foothill Park. So Deanna, if you want to take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Deanna Giuliano. I'm the nursery director and botanical consultant here at Grassroots Ecology. Um, we used to be formerly at Terra, so some of you may have known me from there. Um, I was just going to do a quick little uh, uh, showcase of some of our um, plants I have available on the sale. So I also really love manzanitas and they're really um, fun to propagate. So I really love all the local ones in the Santa Cruz mountains. And um, I have some great mother plants here that I take cuttings from. As you know, manzanitas are really hard from seed and every year I try from seed, but I've only had a few successes. Um, but cuttings are very easy for me. I take them in the winter time, uh, January, well, between December and February, I take them. So some of our really cool manzanitas on the list right now would be the um, Arctostaphylis, uh, Montarensis. This one grows on Montara Mountain. It's quite beautiful. It gets these great um, hairy leaves, um, kind of got this nice silvery color. Um, and this size pot, if you look at our list, is called the AB46. And it's a little smaller than a gallon pot, but I've noticed over time that these size pots are really great. The bottoms as you can see, um, are almost bottomless, and this helps air prune the roots, and really um, these squares make the roots go straight down. So um, I have really love these pots for our restoration sites, and I've switched over to this for all our pots. So I pretty much don't have many gallons around anymore, and I find that the plants do really well. And then um, when you plant them out, they're really adapt really fast. Um, so that's that one. Um, a really another, oh, and this one, the size, it gets um, tree-like. So this one can get up to 15 feet, but that's over many years. So I would say probably in a garden, it's more like eight to 10 feet. Um, another great one is the um, some from Monterey County. This is the Arctostaphylis pumula, 
and this is called sand mat manzanita and this is a really great one for your garden if you're looking for a smaller manzanita that's maybe um i don't know they maybe get three feet there i have one here in the nursery it gets full sun and it does really well um, and of course, all the manzanitas flower in the winter time, which is great for a lot of pollinators, especially hummingbirds. Um, so I have that available. Another great one from, let's see, where's this one? Oh, this is um, from the Santa Cruz Mountains. This is Arctostaphylus canescens. And I think this is one of my favorites, actually. Um, it's Quite, um, they call it canescens because it's really hairy. It's got these really fine silvery hairs. And as they mature, the, the margins of the leaves get this reddish tinge and um, they're really beautiful. These will get maybe eight feet, um, but they, I don't think they get much bigger than that. Um, so that's that one. And then a really great favorite one from the Santa Cruz area is Pajaroensis. And um, this one's another one that's really beautiful. And it maybe gets eight feet at the most, but I would say on average, it's probably more like six feet. And you can prune all of these to kind of shape how you want them when they're, um, when that's the thing with manzanitas, you don't want to prune really large um stems but do more of the shaping when it's younger and um the stems are smaller because they tend to stress out if you um prune them when the stems are too large um and then a really great one for uh, low growing manzanitas is the bearberry the uh, arctostaphylus erva ursi and this one will spread it only gets maybe what six inches uh, to a foot at the most, and then it'll spread probably uh, six feet or more. And these are really great because they're all evergreen, of course, and they all flower in the winter. Um, so that's the manzanitas. And then if you kind of have more of a hot garden, um, I have some, a lot of the, our native buckwheats, the naked stem buckwheats. And these have these great flowers late in the summer like this. And all the native bees really love the buckwheats. So any buckwheat you put in your garden is really going to attract a lot of the great um, native bee population. Uh, and I also have some great um, coyote mint, which is another great bee pollinator um, plant. And they smell really good. So that's for a nice hot garden. Um, and then uh, behind me, I have this grape that I totally hacked back last year and it's completely taking over and the birds are loving it. And it's a Rogers Red that I acquired years ago. And I have a ton of those available. And what's really beautiful about these is at this time of the year, they start turning this beautiful red color and you get these fall foliage and the birds have been loving the fruit. I've been getting the toeys, um, just started getting the golden crown sparrows here. Um, yeah, it's really fun to watch the birds sit at the picnic table and just kind of watch them. Um, and then for a shade garden, I have um, an array of really great plants. I have some Ribe sanguinium, and this will also flower in like January at the earliest, but more like February, March. And, and the hummingbirds love this plant. And it, I think it's a great um, kind of specimen plant for a, a woodland garden. Um, another one that goes well with it would be the ocean spray the holodiscus discolor. And this one also flowers more in the early springtime. And again, it's in the rose family. So it's got this um, cluster of white small flowers that the, the native um, pollinators love. 
and it's a good food source. And then um, another fun one I have from not locally, but um, I acquired it years ago is uh, Vengazia. It's the Canyon Sunflower. And it's a quite beautiful plant if you've got a shady garden, because it gets quite a large uh, sunflower, uh, probably about that big. And it gets kind of shrub-like, so it can get up to eight feet tall. I've seen it in the wild. And I have some of those available. And then some nice um, kind of complement plants for um, your shady garden would be, of course, irises. So this is Iris uh, de Glacii, and this one will get nice purple, purplish tinged flowers. And um, if you get these established at this time of the year in the fall, you can dig them up, your mother plants, and divide them and move them around in your yard. They do really well. And then, of course, um, the yerba buena, which smells really good for a woodland garden. And they're really easy to care for and they just kind of move around and make a nice uh, evergreen ground cover along with the um, Fragaria vesca, the native strawberries, the woodland strawberries, and they have really yummy edible fruit. And then I always love grasses and sedges because I think they add a lot to a garden. And this is a great evergreen Juncus patens uh, rush. And um, I find that they're just kind of uh, add a lot of depth to any garden and they don't take much maintenance at all. And um, they make a nice clump. They won't move underground, but they make a nice uh, clump in the yard that's evergreen. Um, so that's kind of the plants I wanted to share. And then also I wanted to let people know about I don't know how long ago we had a book that we uh, created of local native plants for the Bay Area and we recently revised it and that is going to the printer this next week so I'm really excited because we've been working on it for months and it'll be available through the nursery and I just wanted to share um, kind of what the um, revision will look like. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so this is the cover of the new book. It's the uh, San Francisco Bay Area Native Plants for the Garden. And uh, this is the front and back cover. Um, really excited about it. Like I said, um, I think it came out pretty, pretty good. Um, so basically, we kind of focused more on um, plants of the Bay Area um, that, that are garden worthy. I mean, you could make a huge book if you wanted, but we kind of concentrated on um, some of the more um, common ones or easier to get and nurseries that are easier to grow in a garden. Um, so I'll share kind of how we've put it together. We've kind of put it together as um, groups of like starting with annuals and we go into ferns and, and then we go into grasses, per, uh, we go into woody perennials and herbaceous perennials. So it's really great because it really breaks down um, the different types of uh, plants in our area. And then we've added um, flowering times and we've added um, wildlife values. And um, what else have we added? Any notes we might've thought to add about pruning, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of how it's set up and exposure and watering, of course. And we added symbols instead of text because I feel like sometimes it's nice as a handy guide to just look at something visually. I'm a real visual person myself. So um, I, th I think it's gonna be a real handy book. Um, and then here's just a, a quick little look at like the herbaceous perennial page. 
it kind of is in the same style. And then we'll have evergreen shrubs. And then a really great thing that we've added in the back of the book is um, we've taken all the plants in the book and we've uh, put them into different areas that you could have in your garden. So say you have a oak area or maybe just dry shade under different types of trees. And we've put together these lists that will do really well. Um, we also added the 40 easiest to garden plants to kind of start you off if you're kind of new to native plant gardening. And yeah, that was, I think that was it for that. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And yeah, I hope everyone, uh, I miss being at the plant sale. Um, Gosh, it's it's always great to see everybody, and I really miss that this year. But I hope next year we get to all hang out again. So thanks, Vivian, and everyone. Thank you, Deanna. That was great, and I I'm wanting to buy some of those manzanitas too. Wow, you guys have a great selection. Um, so now we're going to go into the last part of this presentation, and that's about our nursery the CNPS nursery. And um, I wanted to call, do a shout out to Cynthia Gingrich, who is the social uh, chair for the Going Native Garden Tour. She made the video that you saw of Chris doing that mud planting demonstration. And she's made two other amazing videos of our, our nursery. Uh, just ignore the narrator. And, um, but Chris, uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and playing first the nursery tour video. So I'm not, unfortunately, I don't get to be in our nursery talking as Deanna is. I'm so jealous, Deanna. Uh, we don't have wireless working there, but uh, Cynthia came out a couple weeks ago and uh, we're doing our best to simulate being at the nursery. So if you could go ahead and show that, Chris. I will be sharing it just a moment. I need to find it. <laughs> okay, well, while you're doing that, maybe okay. what I should do is go ahead and- Got it, got it. Oh, are you, all right, go ahead. And this time I'm sharing with computer sound, so it won't be as embarrassing as my first attempt. All right, there we go. And let me start the video. Here we go. The tour of the native plant nursery. Uh, remember that uh, the voice on the uh, video is very faint, so I'm going to mute myself now. Chris, it's showing um, part of your desktop. Welcome to our nursery. Um, this nursery was founded by Jean and David Struthers, and Jean is actually one of our, she's our newest chapter fellow. Um, she's been involved as a chapter almost since the beginning. Uh, many CNPS chapters fund their activities through plant sales, and it was uh, a good idea to grow your own plants rather than buying them wholesale and then reselling them. And so Jean was instrumental in finding this location. So where I'm standing right now is actually a hidden villa, which is a, a organic farm in Los Altos Hills, California. And Jean was very good friends with the Duvenek family, which was the family that started this farm. And thanks to her connection with them, they thought it would be a great match for CNPS to locate a nursery here. And they offered us a wonderful deal on getting some space here to have our nursery. And Jean's husband, David, is this amazing carpenter on top of everything else he's really wonderful at doing. And so between the two of them, they were really the backbone of making this nursery come into existence over 20 years ago. So the thing is, at that time, the chapter really didn't have any money. That's one of the reasons we needed to sell plants. And so the, they did an incredible job of finding things from other places that could be repurposed into making this nursery become a real nursery, including finding a greenhouse that had been used by another group that they dismantled. Dave uh, took it in pieces. It was a wooden greenhouse and he 
brought it down here, reassembled it, and until just a few years ago, we used it as our, our primary growing area. So to give you an idea of what I mean by local versus something from the rest of California, I'm going to talk about this plant right here, which is coyote mint. I think many of you will be familiar with this plant. It's very popular uh, to grow in your garden because it's very amenable to a lot of different situations and it has beautiful purple flowers. Unfortunately, we are not in the time period where it's blooming, so you, you can see the nice little green um, leaves. But what you see here is actually a variety of coyote mint. Some of it is very local. Um, we have one that was sourced from Mount Amanam, which is one of the local mountains in this area. But we also have one from the Russian River area, which is And then um, we have another one here called the willowy monardella, which is really, uh, related to in the same genus, but it's actually from Southern California. And it's a rare plant, so you don't find it in many places. Um, and it's also lovely, but again, it's not what we would call a local plant, a local California native. Okay, so I'm standing here in front of our salvia section. And as I was mentioning before, we grow a lot of things that are not locally found in the Santa Clara Valley. And one of the things that a few, few people realize, because so many of us love these California native sages, is that most of the sages are not native to the Santa Clara Valley. Most of us choose to add in to our gardens salvias from other parts of the state. Um, if you look here, Salvia apiana, which is the white sage, is a particularly popular one. It's a, a very large and spectacular plant. Um, it's still small here, but it has these wonderful white gray leaves, and then it has beautiful large flowers. And it was very popular with the native uh, indigenous population here as um, a smoking plant. Uh, Plant. It, they were used it to make smudge sticks. Um, it has a lot of history behind it. Um, many of our other sages are actually hybrids of multiple types or, or species of sages. So what you see up front here is a hybrid of Salvia Clevelandii, which is another very popular sage. Most of our sages that are local bloom in the spring, but we do have some of the southern ones that bloom at other types of the year. And especially if you're adding water into your garden, you can get a much longer bloom period. So here in the nursery, all our plants get water every day. And so oftentimes you will see things blooming in the nursery that may not be blooming in your garden at this time of year, unless you're giving them a fair amount of water. Um, but most of these plants will be perfectly happy without additional water once they're established. You just may not see them blooming at this time of year. As I mentioned before, David Struthers built this for us a couple decades ago and it's still in great shape. And we keep many of our plants that prefer living in the shade in this area. Much of the nursery is in the hot blazing sun here and we're in a valley so they really do get baked. And if it weren't for the shade structure, we wouldn't be able to grow a lot of these plants that you'll only find in nature growing under an oak tree or in some other form of shade. Over here, we have all our irises. So we have Douglas iris and a lot of the Pacific Coast hybrids. There's actually, unfortunately, this isn't the right time of year to see the blossoms, but there's a rainbow of colors represented here, as well as the classic blue Douglas iris and the very popular Canyon Snow white iris. Um, but they're, they're happy here because we have shade, even though it's man-made shade. So right now I am standing in what we call the stock area of the nursery. And this is not a part of the nursery that's open to the general public. It's where we store all the plants that we use to make the plants that we sell. Uh, and we call them mother plants. And they take, we get new plants from them in a variety of ways. Sometimes we gather seeds from them. Other times we actually take the plants out of the pot and divide them and then make many new plants from them. Um, other way, the other way we 
get plant, new plants from an existing plant is to take cuttings and then root those cuttings. So this area represents the entirety of California. There are plants pretty much from every part of California in our stock area. Welcome to our greenhouse. This greenhouse is about three years old to us. Um, it, we used to have a, a large wooden greenhouse, but there was a, um, we had to redo the whole entire nursery a few years ago to meet the latest standards for best management practices to keep our plants healthy. And at that time, we were very fortunate in that the Presidio nursery had an extra greenhouse and donated it to us. So we actually took a U-Haul, drove it up to Fort Funston, which is part of the Presidio greenhouse system, and they had dismantled it. We picked it up, brought it back down here, and we had wonderful volunteers who were able to reassemble it here. And this greenhouse, if we'd had to buy it, would be over $20,000. So we were very, very fortunate that they were willing to let us have it um, because they no longer needed it. And it's been wonderful for us. It allows us to grow plants in a very clean fashion. So we were in the stock area. The next place you would come if you were a baby plant just starting is to our greenhouse. And whether it's by seed or by cuttings, this is where the next step that for plants to get started. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about why we had to remodel our nursery a few years ago. Uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with sudden oak death, which is a disease that's killing a lot of our native oaks. Um, that is a within the family of diseases called Phytophthora. And there, that disease name in Greek actually means plant destroyer. So Phytophthoras are really deadly. In fact, they cause the Irish potato famine. And uh, about six, six years, six or seven years ago, there was a restoration site where all the plants that had been planted out just died very quickly. And so when the California uh, CDFA went in to try to figure out what had happened, they discovered that there was a new form of Phytophthora that had made its way into California. And in fact, it was one of the, the diseases that was on the top 10 watch list for plant diseases um, that's maintained at the federal level. And it previously it hadn't been known and especially not known in the wild in California. And obviously this is a, a huge problem for us because our native plants don't have a resistance to the disease. And if they get into our wild areas, they can wipe out large portions of our native plant life. So that especially became a concern for native plant nurseries because we, one, our plants don't have the resistance to this disease. And then the other problem is that if they get planted close to a wild area, or if they get planted in a wild area, there's a potential for infection and huge environmental devastation. So it became very important for all nurseries, but especially for native plant nurseries, to figure out how to keep this disease out of the nursery, how to grow clean plants. And that turned out to be a very difficult problem because unlike sudden oak death, which is actually um, transmitted through droplets, this new type of Phytophthora, or new to California, is transmitted through water. So most, all the Phytophtheras do get transmitted through water, but they're transmitted underground. So they're transmitted through groundwater and they are transmitted from root to root. So when you plant an infected plant, that plant's root system is going to be releasing lots and lots of the pathogen into your dirt, which is of course going to mean that anything that you plant there later is also going to die. And it's going to spread because the water will carry it across. So it's, it's a very important pathogen to keep out of your garden. And we be, although they were not able to trace the exact source, it's believed it actually was brought in through the nursery trade. Um, a common thing that nurseries did 
prior to this was uh, use, reused pots and they, they were reused without sterilization so that if you had a pot that had dirt from a, an infected plant then that potentially could infect the plant that was the new plant that got put into that pot so everything had to be changed but the thing is that once it's in the ground if the water splashes up from the ground that potentially can infect the plants so for example you, you don't want to put your pots on the ground so one of the things that nurseries have to do is lift their plants off the ground we used to put our plants on the ground if the, if you've been in our nursery before the last five years to one of our sales or if you've been a volunteer here you have seen a lot of plants in pots on the ground if you look around now you will not see any plants on the ground and they're not only not on the ground but they're three feet above the ground which is considered above the splash zone so when it rains or if there's just water splashing around from our irrigation system it will not be able to go off the ground and onto our plants and potentially infect them if i top the room the ground around here so that drove an entire set of changes for our nursery including our new greenhouse and it was very very expensive and very just a lot of volunteer hours i mean hundreds and hundreds of volunteer hours and donations and we're very grateful for our the wonderful chapter members and other people who donated both their time and money to making this happen because now our our nursery can produce clean plants but it requires all the volunteers to follow certain processes as well as all the changes we had to make to the nursery itself Okay, so this was it. Yeah, and so um, again, thanks to Cynthia for putting that together. That was a lot of work and I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to show you guys a little bit about what you'll see um, in terms of pots actually from us. Um, let me see, here we go. So, uh, when you shop with us you, uh, in our online store, you're gonna see um, the plants available in different sizes. And I thought it might be helpful for you to actually see a picture of the pots next to each other so you can get a better understanding of what it is you're gonna be buying. So this first pot on the left side of the picture, let me see, if, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yeah, there we go, this one. This is what we call a four inch tall pot. So I think everybody's familiar with those little four inch flimsy plastic pots that you get things like at Annie's or, or just at the at most nurseries. Um, this pot is actually a, a bit taller than that. So it has a little bit more space for roots. And so we do sell some of our plants in a four inch and this is what that pot looks like. Um, the next size we use is what we call our five inch square. And whoops. Um, my mouse is refusing me to go. There we go. Um, so this one is the five inch square and most of our perennials, things like penstemons, the salvias uh, are in this pot. So you can see it right next to the one gallon. It's a little bit smaller, um, but it has plenty of space for most of the, uh, all of those, those shrubby uh, perennials. Um, and then the next one is the one gallon. I think everybody knows what a one gallon is and our, sh our shrubs and some of our small trees are in the one gallon pots. And then finally, we have what we call our 13 and a half inch tall pot. And our bigger trees are in this pot. So when you're going through our online store, um, when you see the different sizes, this is what you'll be getting. And then I also wanted to show you, uh, let me see if I can get to share thing. Uh, I also just wanted to show you what our store looks like and explain the, the sale process. Um, let's see if I can try to. Okay. So after this uh, talk is over, I'm going to be turning on sales in the store. So 
right now you can actually go to our store and it's right there. The URL is there. It's on our website. Uh, I think I, I'll put it, make sure I put it in the chat. But you can go to this store and um, if you click shop now, and so right now it's not allowing anyone to buy things, but you can actually go to the store at this instant and see what we have. And uh, everything is here. So I don't have a separate inventory list because what we have is all here in this store. Uh, you can look over here on the side and there's a menu. If you wanna buy a Going Native Garden Tour t-shirt, you can do that too and pick it up when you pick your plants up. They're amazing t-shirts. Uh, we have a, uh, one book so far. We're gonna be actually be adding more books, but we have one book. And if you want one of those native plants live here signs, we also have them as well. And then we have the plants and uh, I'm actually still to, uh, making improvements to the store, but right now um, you can also just, if you want say, for example, look at the ferns that we have. Uh, the ground cover area is definitely a work in progress, but I'm, I know people are always asking us about ground covers and some of the other groupings. So I'm gonna be adding those as uh, the week goes on. But right now, all there is is uh, some of the plants that are available uh, for uh, dry shade. And then you can just click plants to see everything that we have. Now, it's, um, you can, what we'd like you to do is first go to the store, buy your plants, and then the store is, uh, will say that you can pick them up next week, but it's actually not enough just to come by the nursery. In fact, please do not just come by the nursery. There will be a link in your, um, your order completion screen that tells you where to go. And that is to this sign up on Sign Up Genius. Uh, we're, we are doing the pickup on the 17th, but in order to keep things orderly and to make sure that we have your order ready for you when you arrive, you'll, you need to come to this screen and sign up for a pickup time and you'll, you'll get a half hour window. We're gonna have be open from 10 to three and um, you just pick your half, the half hour that you think you can arrive. It's very important that you do this. If you arrive uh, and you don't have a pickup time, we'll probably have to ask you to come back later because we can only stage a certain number of orders at a time. And so in order, so to make sure that we have your order ready for you when you arrive, and so that we can do a contactless uh, delivery of that order into your car, we really do need you to sign up for a time. Um, it'll ask you for your order number, so do make sure that you've actually uh, placed your order before you come to this page. And then um, that way, when you show up, we'll have your plants ready for you and we'll load them into your car. You do not need to bring boxes. So those of you who have purchased from us before and are well-trained to bring your own boxes for your pickup, you do not need to do that this year. We're taking care of all of that for you. Okay, and uh, we have, well, actually, you know, we do have one more video. It was just another tour of the nursery to go over our plants, but I'm looking at the time and I think I'm gonna go ahead and skip that. And let's just go into the QA section. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and type them into the QA and uh, panelists, Let's go ahead and um, start answering questions. And uh, answering questions today, we have Deanna Guliano, who is uh, the nursery manager from Grassroots, uh, Madeline, uh, Mad Madeline Morrow, who is our chapter's past president, co-chair of the Going Native Garden Tour, all around amazing person. She has one of the best native plant gardens I've ever seen. <laughs> And she's here with us today. She's also uh, the chair of the plant sale this year. Uh, we have Chris, who, as you saw, has this incredible garden, knows the best methods for planting. Uh, we have Melanie Cross, who is our previous nursery manager. And then does she, who is one of our plant propagators. So if we want to why don't we go ahead and, and start answering some of the questions that have come up. And I think Madeline is going to be our moderator today. So go ahead, Madeline. Um, uh, Deanna, do you want to answer 
the question about the grassroots ecology book. It said you wanted to answer it live. Sure. Um, I think I tried to answer it and then I was confused. So <laughs> anyways, um, the book will be going um, to the printer this next week. So we'll probably have it within the month and we'll probably uh, check on our website, grassrootsecology.org to see uh, when it's available. And then it'll be ordered through the nursery uh, page. So I'll be adding some text on there this next week about that. And um, the email is just nursery at grassrootsecology.org. And then I, it'll be able to be picked up at the nursery. We're not going to be mailing them out or anything because it just seems like a hassle. But um, yeah, that's kind of how we're going to go uh, about it. And the same with ordering plants through the nursery. Um, you can go on our website and the nursery has a page and then go on to nursery sales and then it has our online inventory and what's available and then you would order off of that and email nursery at grassrootsecology.org. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm, as the manager of logistics for the pickup, I do want to emphasize, you know, as you know, we're in a pandemic. So for this to happen, we had to get our procedures approved by the Santa Clara County Board of Health. So it's very important that people sign up. We have promised it's going to be a contact-free delivery. We have, we, have a, we have to monitor the number of people on site. So it's absolutely vital that you sign up and don't just show up. Thanks. Okay, I wanna go back to a question that was a little bit um, complicated about a planter. Yeah, a four by eight raised bed. Um, wanting to be pollinator attractive and attractive all year round. Um, if you want to be pollen, I'm just, I'm going to answer this. Other people can chime in. But one of the things I want to say is to be pollinator attractive, you have to work on having bloom period at multiple times of the year. And many plants that are best for pollinators don't necessarily look attractive all year. One of the things that I would recommend for this bed, and I'm, I came up with a list of things, assuming it got sun in the morning and maybe some shade in the afternoon, and all these plants would do really well under those conditions. Um, I would recommend a low growing manzanita because manzanitas look good all year round and they're extremely valuable for pollinators in late winter, early spring. So um, I haven't looked at our inventory as to which ones we have right now. I mean, some of the low growing ones are Uva Ursi, Arctostaphylus Uva Ursi. And um, the species is better because the commonly available hybrid emerald carpet doesn't flower very much. So, the ones that Deanna has, she has the species Uva Ursi would do better. Um, Carmel Soar is one of the other low growing ones. Um, I have that in my garden, it does well. You know, and you can, they spread, but they're slow growing. You can keep them in bounds. But some other plants for pollinators. Um, for spring, I'd recommend Heuchera species, coral bells or alum root. Um, and um, actually what some of the Pacific Coast irises, which actually do look good out of flower, they have attractive foliage that looks good all year round. Um, you have to have some shade for them to be doing well. But once again, morning sun, afternoon shade works. Um, coyote mint for the late spring, early summer. Monkey flowers bloom over a long period of time if they're happy. Uh, for summer, gum plants or grandelia species and buckwheat. Some of the smaller buckwheats for this planter would be the rosy buckwheat um, 
and coast buckwheat. Um, and Epilobium California fuchsia, there are well behaved species like select metal that would do well. Um, I could allow. Oh. No, your photo is not there. Okay. Um, anyway, that's what I have to say about that one. Um, and for shrubs for the front, small shrubs for a front yard, um, small varieties of coffee berry, small varieties of ceanothus, um, um, salvia munzii, which Chris showed really big, has never gotten that big in my garden. It stays small. And once again, the small manzanitas. Um, and one thing that has a presence like a small shrub is uh, the Douglas Iris Canyon snow. It is the largest and most dramatic foliage of all the um, Pacific Coast Iris. It blooms very heavily during its period and it looks good all year round. And of course the buckwheats and gambelia are other species that tend to stay small. And you also might would consider deer grass um, months, um, as a small, very dramatic plant. For, I mean, well, it's not small in that it needs at least three feet, maybe three and a half to four feet, but it's so dramatic. Anyway. Does anybody else want to chime in on some of these? I probably wouldn't recommend Gambelia. This can grow 12 feet across <laughs> if, if really happy. Uh, I think that Ariogonum arborescens might be a good central point planted in the middle. It can grow about four feet wide. Uh, it's fairly slow growing, so it's not going to overtake the entire area in me right away. But it's also a plant that blooms for a long time and attracts a lot of pollinators. Oh. Okay, Chris, do you want to talk about, uh, someone has a question about hard clay soil. What plants would you recommend? Oh, uh, I had a good experience with a, with a lot of cyanotus. Uh, the good place to check whether the play, plant is uh, clay tolerant, there are two places actually that I would recommend. One is the website of the Las Pilitas Nursery. Uh, they have uh, each plant uh, there is characterized as to you know, what type of soil they, it will take, whether it's, it needs sandy soil or clay soil. The other is Theodore Payne Nursery uh, has, uh, or uh, sorry, Theodore's Payne Society, I think. Uh, they have an uh, encyclopedia kind of, of, of native plants. And yeah. They also specify very, very well the growing conditions for everything. Uh, from uh, my experience, uh, Cyanotus, uh, the, the, the Cerastis subgenus, uh, which uh, are Cyanotuses with a smaller and hard leaves uh, and, and kind of spiky leaves. Uh, this would be Cyanotus maritimus, uh, Cyanotus cuneatus, Cyanotus rigidus. Uh, those do well in clay, definitely, because I have lots of them. Uh, the lemonite berry and sugar bush, Russovata and Rus integrifolia, those are perfect for, for clay. Uh, mountain mahogany, uh, well, basically, you know, this entire list that, that I presented uh, during the presentation, I can, I can read it again, but you can just as well uh, go and review it later. If, if uh, I can be more specific, please, please uh, ask, ask a more specific question and I can try to answer it. Vivian, uh, okay, there's a question about bulbs. Will we have bulbs? Sorry about that. Uh, we won't have bulbs. I don't know, maybe Deanna, are you gonna have any bulbs? Um, they're, they're all dormant right now. So I usually, it's, I mean, I don't have them on the inventory, but if somebody was really interested in certain things, I might be able to uh, acquire some of those. I mean, I have bulbs, but 
they're, they just look like nothing in the pots right now. You know what I mean? So they're always hard to sell. I might have a few chlorogallums, I think, available. Yeah, unfortunately for us, we usually have people who come to our sales um, who have, you know, who bring the bulbs to sell and we have a limited number, but this year we just weren't able to do that. I can Sorry, mention that Linda Vista Native Plant Nursery does offer some bulbs for sale. That's right. Larry Voss uh, down in San Jose, Linda Vista. And you can find a list of native plant nurseries on our website. I typed in uh, into the chat a while ago our resource, our gardening resource page, and that has a list of a lot of native plant nurseries, including Linda Vista. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with Linda Vista, go over there and you should be able to find the the connect the website. Okay. Going back to the raised bed question, it's full sun. So buckwheats are good for full sun. Um, Cyanothus valley violet developed at UC Davis is supposed to be take full sun in my heavy clay yard. It seems to prefer some afternoon shade, but I think in a raised bed, it may well do better. Um, and manzanitas, of course, can take full sun, most of them. If I could add something uh, that could be very small, but come up through it and the pollinators would love it, is soap plant, which is one of the bulbs we were just talking about. Um, that would be excellent to plant a few of those in. It would add some drama and um, especially if it's someplace you're around in the late afternoon when the flowers open. So that's right. And, and gum plant, gum plant, the grundelia species also like full sun and they, they love full sun. They're large perennials. They don't look good all year, but they, they are the mainstay of my summer garden. And um, another thing to consider for spring blooming plants is some of the, the reliably recurring um, annuals like Clarkia. Um, Clarkias will look absolutely beautiful for several months. They're annuals, but they come up every year. And in addition to pollinators, if you leave some of the seed heads, I get finches coming through to eat the seeds. I mean, they're a really great habitat plant. And um, California poppies, of course, you'll have to weed out some of the volunteers, but they are beautiful for early spring very popular with pollinators. I wanted to add evening primrose. It gets yeah. kind of weedy though, but um, it's a great pollinator and it also um, has tons of seeds for the birds. Okay. Another one is also verbena. There's uh, verbena lalicina, but there's also Verbenia, which is actually from Southern California, and strictly speaking, I don't even think it's in from inside the state, but it is within the California Floristic Province. But there's also our local one, which uh, actually we don't have at the nursery right now. I don't know if you, you've got it, uh, Deanna? Yes, all right. Verbenia so from uh, Deanna, but it's, and it makes a really nice ground cover. And it, it, you know, they're beautiful purple flowers. It even takes a little bit of foot traffic. So I, I highly recommend that one too. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Another question, um, what is, somebody wanted, wanted to know, which I got from the chat of plants for planting under um, coast live oak. Anybody wanna weigh in on that one? Oh yeah, there's a lot that they're good. Salvia spathacea is actually very nice under there, and it has those talk about pollinator plants. That that one is spectacular, and it's you know it does well under oaks. Other things you can put honeysuckle under an oak that works well as a ground cover. Uh, 
Similarly, snowberry, both the, the tall and the prostrate forms, so mollus and albus, are both fine under oaks. Uh, not a ground cover, but actually is fine under oaks, actually, it's the holodiscus that uh, Deanna was mentioning earlier. It, it's got this beautiful white sprays of flowers in the spring, and it, it, you know, you find it naturally under oaks. If you're ever out hiking, you can often find it sort of right on the edge of oaks. Um, another one that works well is actually Aster decymphocarpus. Uh, that one you can goes under oaks just fine. Uh, I'll let other people take it away. Those are my thoughts, though. So. My, my favorite plant for basically any shade under any tree is Ribis viburnifolium. Mm -hmm. It's not locally native, but it has this benefit that it is the, probably the easiest plant to propagate. So the way that I uh, plant it is uh, typically it's, it's in the winter when the, when the soil is wet. And basically cut off a branch from uh, existing plant, uh, strip the lower leaves, uh, poke a hole with a screwdriver down into the ground, stick the, 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 the branch into the ground, st stomp around it to, to make sure that it's in contact in the soil and go away. And this will, in a 95% of, of cases, it will actually root and, and grow into a full plant. So uh, the good thing about this is you don't disturb the soil uh, under the oak uh, because all you do is just basically pencil size hole and that's it. I wanted to add a really great um, under oaks for late uh, summer, early fall is the goldenrod, the Solidago valutina um subspecies californica that one is incredible under the oaks and you get that late flowering and lots of pollinators and of course irises iris fernaldii is a local good one okay um chris would you recommend the planting in mud method for penstemon well, unfortunately, I don't really plant many penstemons, so I can't be 100% sure that it will work. It, 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 it has to be an experiment. You know, try, try it with mud, try it in normal way, see which one does better. Uh, I, at this point, I, unfortunately, uh, I have only penstemon heterophilus in my garden, and this one survived fine. Uh, it also spread by, by, by seed. So I have volunteers that are doing much better than the original plant anyway. Um, and uh, for some plants, uh, I guess planting from seed is, is preferable. Uh, I haven't tried it with, uh, I have tried it, I think with Penstemon centrantifolius, it didn't survive. So I'm, I'm sitting on the fence on this one, whether it can be recommended or not. Uh, basically not enough experience. Um, also about, there was a question um, about planting in mud. After you plant, use it, when do you water the net new plant next? Well, um, a, a few days later? It depends and on the time of year, but uh, remember that uh, one of the uh, points of, of digging the hole and watering is it is to soak about five to 15 gallons of water into the ground. So there is really no need to water it very soon, but the rule is standard that if the top two inches are dry of the soil under the plant, then it's, it's time to, to water it. Uh, generally, let's say if you plant something in uh, October or late October, early November, where the winter rains will provide enough water. So there is no need to start watering until probably May. And then I generally water it uh, every two weeks in May. Uh, in in uh, June, I start uh, reducing it to once every three weeks, maybe do, do it three or four times. Uh, September, uh, typically one watering, October one watering, and then the rains come again, so everything is just fine. But definitely, you know, a couple of days, it's, there's no need to, to, to attend to it so, for, so quickly. 
Um, Deanna, someone wants to know what was the verbena that you mentioned. We need to type that into the chat. Verbena Lazio Staggies, and I just typed it in. Great. Thank you. Uh huh. And somebody also wanted to know um, when, if you use the mud method in fall as well as spring. And of course, uh, Chris just answered that. Um, yes. 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 I, I use it in, in both seasons. Basically, my planting season is typically from October until March. I suppose um, I work in summer too, but uh, I haven't done much of that. It's just... Someone asked, what are the differences between Aragonum fasciculatum and I guess the two varieties which are rosy buckwheat and coast buckwheat that I mentioned. And of or course, that, that may be a specific question about our nursery. I don't know if that is, but because we happen to have two Ariogonum fasciculatums in our nursery. So I, I'm guessing that's about what we have because it, it is a little tricky. There's both just the plain species and then there's an Ariogonum fasciculatum foliosum. They're very similar um, and I can, so I'm, I'm not positive that that's what that question is, but I see it and I'm just guessing because we happen to have two of them that might be the one it's regarding. And so I'll just talk about those two and if somebody else wants to jump in and talk about others, um, please go ahead. But in the ones that we have listed, the one that's listed as a plain species, uh, it's it has a, a much, so I'm just gonna talk about the appearance. That particular one has a much lower, larger flower cu cluster. It's uh, more upright and it's actually a much more vigorous grower. So if you have a larger space, um, I would recommend getting the one that's the plain species. The other one is a little floppier. The seed heads are, I mean, the flower clusters are slightly smaller and uh, you can keep it in a smaller space. So just from a, a gardening standpoint, that would be the difference between those two on our site. Yes, it should be also mentioned that Erigonum fasciculatum has several cultivars that can be purchased, maybe not from CNPS, but from other nurseries. There is a vari variety called Warriner Little, which grows uh, about a foot and a half tall, which is much, much lower growing than the straight species. And there is another one, uh, Theodore Payne variety, that grows maybe about a foot tall. And we have learned our litter, Lytle, at the, on our store too. Okay, Lytle or Little, I'm not sure how to pronounce Yeah, I'm not sure either. <laughs> the low one, but that it, we have that one as well. Okay, uh, I have a, another question is, do we have a, a video of Chris's planting method outside of this video? Um, although, of course, after this talk, this video is going to go up on our YouTube channel. And since his video is early on, you can refer to it at any time. It usually takes about a day for this video to appear on our YouTube channel, but it will always be accessible at that point. I actually, it should be available immediately. It just yes. will show up. It sh shows up in the live area for the first few hours and then YouTube magically switches it over into the plain video section. Um, we also have on our website, a handout that shows the steps of Chris's method. So you can also it's, refer just to the handout. And I put that in the chat a while ago. Right, but and I reposted a, it in case people lost it. Yeah. Okay, um, somebody wants to know about smallish native salvias. I'm not sure quite how we define smallish. In my experience, the only smallish um, native salvia is salvia munzii, but I keep a salvia leucophila, which is purplish blue, um, small by pruning it back to about, you know, 12 to 24 inches every winter. You can maintain them that way and they actually look better. And all 
Salvia munzii has electric blue flowers, not purple. I, I like that color, but it's a matter of taste. Anybody else chime in? Yeah, I just wanted to, we have quite a few salvias in stock right now. Uh, we don't have munzii, unfortunately, but we do have a cultivar, uh, a hybrid called Gail Nielsen, which is definitely on the small side. It, I think it only gets to about three feet and you can probably make it smaller just by trimming it back. It has these really lovely blue flowers. So that would be the one I would recommend of the ones that we have at our nursery. Um, that's the smallest one. Uh, I also Another. Can, sorry, I also can mention Salvia doriae. This one definitely stays small after five or six years. The one that I was showing is maybe two and a half feet tall. That's it. And two, two maybe three feet across. I was going to suggest Salvia sinominensis, but it's tricky in some gardens. It really needs um, some drainage and hillside, but um, it's a low grower and it'll spread, but it doesn't get very high. Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can second that. Uh, the salvia sonomensis does fine. It also does, does fine in, in partial shade, so it, it's one of those plants you might want to put under oaks maybe, or let, let it spread into under, under the oaks and, and see how it does. Judy suggested Bee's Bliss. I've seen that get really big. You would have to prune it. <laughs> yeah. They 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 can be because uh, that's a hybrid between Sonomanensis and Leucophila, right? Yes. And so I think they get can get two to three feet, but um, I think if you were selectively prune it, you could keep it lower. Mm, it it stays fairly low for me. I have a couple of those. And two feet is probably tops. It will climb over other plants if it has a chance. Uh, it's very, it's fairly sp aggressive spreader. The, the biggest one that I have is probably 20 feet across, which by now is multiple, is multiple plants because it also roots on the way as it spreads. Yeah, in our demo garden, we have Bees Bliss and Dara's Choice, which is another low grower a hybrid. And they're sort of battling it out. I mean, they're both definitely trying to spread and they're spreading into each other. And it's, we still haven't figured out who's gonna win that war. <laughs> so Vivian, do we have Salvia Sono Menensis in the nursery or only we selections? Don't, we don't have it. I don't, maybe Deanna, do you have some of it? Um, I'm propagating some right now, but um, I might have some maybe in a few months. And Chris, there's another mud method question. I don't know, do you have access to the questions? Yes, I do. And this is, if we use mud method for plants that are well rooted, do you put the plant in hole first and add the mud around it? Or do you still put mud in first and try to get the whole root ball in the mud? Uh, if, if it has really nice roots at the bottom, I put very little mud at the bottom and then kind of you know, twist the, 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 the root ball into that mud and then fill it on the sides uh, with, with, uh, by pouring mud over it. Uh, so I hope that that, that answers this question. It, it, uh, it can be done both ways. Uh, if, if, the, if the mud is uh, fairly loose, then you can put the uh, entire one gallon root ball into it and it will float around. It's always also important to shake the, the root ball a little bit after planting so that to get rid of, of any air that might, might have gotten trapped. But uh, yes, uh, you, can, you can do it e e either, either way. I'm going to answer the question about the from Carol Gonsalves about the mountain mahogany. I am actually growing, it's recommended for narrow spaces. I'm actually growing it against my chimney and I keep it narrow by, it's not exactly a spalier because it supports itself, but I keep it narrow by um, 
pruning it fairly heavily and selectively every every year. And um, I have seen no signs of damage from the roots. Um, so I, I don't think it will damage retaining walls or foundations. I, unless, possibly if it gets a ton of water, it might, but you also don't wanna water it too much because it means it grows too fast. Deanna, it looks like you have ideas about this. I was going to say, yeah, on some of those more chaparral species, if you overwater, they'll, they'll really apt to rot and get diseases in their crowns. Yeah, I can also add to the, the, the mountain mahogany question. I haven't seen any roots near the surface uh, when I look around the plant. So I suspect that it, it sends the roots more, more downward than sideways. Uh, I don't grow any, any of them near my house, so I can't answer this question at 100% accuracy. Um, but from my observations, I, th I think it's, it's, uh, it should be fine. And uh, I know that Madeline grows one near her home and everything is fine there too. Uh, who wants to chime in on an app to take a picture and identify what plant it is? I haven't used them much, so anybody well, would, with experience? Yeah, I would recommend Seek, which is a, a offshoot of iNaturalist. If you can use it for both uh, plants and animals, basically anything outside, anything that people in iNaturalist uh, have been recording, and it, it works really well. I, and you can also use it even when you're not connected to the internet, which is very helpful when you're out hiking. And, and, uh, and uh, the really fastest way of, of uh, getting the correct answer is uh, to take the picture, post it into CNPS uh, group on Facebook. And typically you get answers within a minute uh, from people who actually recognize the species correctly. iNaturalist sometimes produces uh, interesting answers. Uh, so the, that, that's one group and the other group uh, to ask uh, f p questions about plants based on the photos is, Cali is there is a group with, uh, that deals with invasive plants in California. So anything non-native can be frequently identified there. Both are on Facebook and this is really the only reason to use Facebook for me. Actually, I, I oh. Chris, are you done? Sorry, I didn't want to. Uh, I'm done. Um, another th thing that's not an app, but uh, we had a talk by Bruce uh, Homer Smith about his uh, plantid.net. So it's literally plant, plantid, P L A N T I D.net site, uh, which is a great way to just you know figure out something that you've seen when you're hiking. It helps you walk through a bunch of questions about the plant and then lets you essentially figure it out for yourself. And I think it's a good way of helping to train yourself actually to, to notice things about plants so that you can identify them. And we do have that talk recorded on our YouTube channel if uh, you're interested in learning more. And the app I mentioned is Seek, S-E-E-K, just like you're seeking something. So uh, you can Google for it and I'll, I'll try to find the link and type it into the chat. Um, there's another question about Ribes sanguinium and holodiscus. Do they bloom earlier in woodland gardens at lower elevations than the ones grown in the wild or gardens at higher elevations? I mean, bloom time is definitely a function of elevation. Um, I, it's also situation. I, you know, I mean, I think in general, things bloom earlier at lower elevations than higher elevations. It's why you can go to say the Hetch Hetchy area in June or July and see things which have been finished for a while in Santa Clara Valley. And the red buds along the Merced Valley going into Yosemite bloom later than my red bud in my garden. But, um, 
the micro environments makes makes a difference too. So it's always a little hard to answer. And we see this on the garden tour, where when you go from garden to garden, you can see the same plant in different stages in different gardens. It's always interesting to see. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? I guess not. There's one more question I okay. see that I think was not answered. Uh, do you have seeds or, or, or for annuals? Oh, yes. Vivian? Oh, you are muted. Um, no, we don't sell seeds um, in general at our nursery. Um, not sure what to say go when you when you're on the garden tour you can ask if you might collect a few seeds um any any other suggestions larner seeds is, i think is the best place actually if yeah. you want seeds larner seeds and larner seeds something called yeah. sns seeds uh, i think theodore payne sells seeds too but that's more south larner larner i like yeah yeah, Theodore Plain has a lot of fun seeds. And and like Chris said, SNS. And there's also Seed Hunt, actually. Seed Hunt is a good, another great seed place to get seeds. And if you're in the East Bay at the Botanical Garden at Tilden, they usually have seeds for sale. I don't think they're open now, though. That's Oh, it's by reservation. Okay, we have a couple more questions that are now in the chat. Um, um, one of them about, I, and um, would you recommend planting Salvia Clevelandii with Ceanothus, Julia Phelps, adjacent to each other in the shade as foundation plants? I mean, I'm going to weigh in to say Salvia clevelandii will take partial shade. It will not take full shade. And I know this from sad experience in my garden as trees that have grown have shaded out Salvia clevelandii. Yeah, yes, I, so, I'll echo Madeline on that one. I had the same experience. Yeah, I also think that Julia Phelps need, needs more of full sun rather than shade. Uh, for partial shade, some of Cyanotus maritimus might, might do well. Salvia clevelandii will take some afternoon shade, but it has to get a decent amount of sun for it to thrive. I've had it do pretty well. I'm having it do pretty well right now where it gets probably shade starting at three o'clock. Yeah, I've got some Salvia sonomensis growing in the shade and it's reasonably happy. Okay. I, uh, I saw a question about um, native peoples and resources of native plants. Um, I would suggest Kat Anderson's book. It gives a really great overview of how the native peoples manage the land for thousands of years. Um, and there's other resources. Um, maybe I can put it in later. But I did my thesis on ethnobotany at UCSC, so um, you can contact me at my email, and I can give you some more resources. I typed. I typed um, the book. It's called Tending the Wild. It's fantastic. So if there's resources you're interested in, you can read about them and then plant them in your garden and use them. Um, and there was a question about. Um, root bound. What if a manzanita coming out of a pot is root bound? Should I tease out the root ball or root prune it? I am not, I do not have as, as much experience with plant, planting as Chris, so I'm wondering what he has to say about this. Uh, generally, it's a good idea to check the plant before you buy it. If, if uh, the nursery won't let you inspect the root ball before buying, then go to another nursery. Chris, uh, I, um, just to stop you right there, right now we're doing mostly online shopping, so oh. that's not 
a very practical. Oh yeah, yeah, very right. I, I was <laughs> reflecting to to my past years of buying when I ever bought everything you know, in person. But generally, I would look quickly at the root ball before buying the plant. Uh, teasing the roots out is always safer than, than cutting them. Uh, if, there, if, if you have, on the other hand, if you have, let's say, an inch of, of uh, coiled roots at the bottom, I think that this time a root pruning uh, probably accompanied with a little bit of pruning at the top uh, so that the, the plant doesn't try to support the lush top growth with pruned roots. I think this would be the, the thing to do. But uh, trying to spread them and tease them out is, is definitely the, the first choice. The second choice would be to try to cut across at the bottom of the root ball and spread the roots that way. And if it, it, uh, this will minimize the, the damage to the roots. And uh, you know, if, if, if the roots are really, uh, really seriously root bound, um, pretty much no matter what you do is, 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 uh, is, is this destined to fall, fail. Uh, if, if, you leave, if you leave the roots coiled around, it, it, this will strangle the plants into you. If you cut them, you probably have more chance of getting it to leave. But uh, be as gentle as possible if, uh, whenever you operate on the roots of, of a root, root bound plant. Okay, um, I'm going to go to um, the question from YouTube. Any experience with California laurel, which I mean, I believe to mean Prunus illicifolia var lionia. Cal yeah. I think it's also called California laurel. And that is a plant, I, I'm not keeping it to six to eight feet, but I planted that because I read you could prune it any way, any time of year, because I have it growing along a path. And I have pruned it at any time of year it never gets branch die back. You, and then I've read you can prune it into topiary if you want. So um, it's very amenable to pruning. Um, don't overwater it if, because it will be easier to keep it to six to eight feet, but you can prune it at any time of year, whenever you think of it, in my experience. She might've meant bay, bay tree. Uh, I don't know. Oh. And I have no experience. I just thought I'd toss that in. Oh, oh. okay. Yeah. Laurel, California. Sumac, or California Bay. Anybody know about that? I've never grown Ca it. California Bay wants to grow many feet tall, so there, there is no way to keep it six to eight. I, it, it's got to be the America Californica that, that she meant. Well, actually, California Bay, just because I tend to get a lot of them growing. Uh, volunteering in my yard. I kept one at about that height probably for not actually this was before I knew anything about California plants to be honest a squirrel planted one in my hedge and I just kept trimming it and it stayed under 10 feet for probably I don't know 15 years before we finally took the whole hedge out including the bay but it was in retro now that I know more I'm actually I was I'm surprised and I did that accidentally but it was amazingly amenable to being. That's, that's interesting. Just chopped, like, just with a hedge trimmer, actually. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those. It's probably twenty feet tall by now, but again, it was never pruned. Yeah, see, that's the thing is, it was just there in the hedge growing, and I noticed it because it smelled nice, and we just kept, you know, pruning the hedge as normal and left it there, and and it lived and it thrived and it. You know, if we hadn't ripped it out with the rest of the hedge, it would probably be a large tree by now. I wanted to suggest that um, most California natives deal with herbivory on a consistent basis, and they really can deal with pruning. So don't be afraid to prune your plants as you kind of want your aesthetics, because most of them are very, very... Um, they kind of want it and it'll invigorate new growth. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, ultimately that bay wants to be a big tree, but if you're 
if you want to use it, you know, in a smaller space, you could probably keep it going in that smaller space for quite a while before it got to the point where you, you might have to make a decision to replace it with something else. If you want a tree in a, some, in a small space that um, you can keep small, I would actually recommend Western Redbud, Circus occidentalis. Um, native peoples used it for basketry and they coppiced it for year after year to keep, and I've started doing that with one that's, um, I planted it in a place where I shouldn't have planted it. And so every, every year I prune out like three or four of the taller canes and I am keeping that plant to um, about four feet. You could let it go a little bit taller. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those plants that, um, parent, you know, I mean, the native peoples, I learned this from tending the wild, said it's basically eternal if you tend it by pruning it. And what you do with that is you just, you know, look at, you know, I, after it loses its leaves, I say, okay, which are the taller canes? And I go and, and cut them off at the ground level. And it blooms better that way too. Anyway, that's, if you really want a bay, okay, that's one thing, but if you want a small, small tree to fill a space and not get too big, try a um, California red bud. I would also suggest a local um, oak that's really a great, if you can't have a live oak, is uh, the scrub oak, Quercus burbidifolia. They're quite beautiful and they don't get very big. And then if it's just an evergreen uh, that you're, you, you need something evergreen to fill the space, Toyon actually works pretty well. It can get it, you know, pretty tall, but you can trim it to whatever size you want. And it is evergreen. Um, coffee berries the same way. It uh, tends to be a little shorter than Toyon, but uh, you know, they're both evergreen. They will get to the height you want pretty quickly and they're beautiful. Lots of berries for birds and other animals. Okay, um, there's another request for list of plants that grow under oaks. Isn't that one of the things that we have available on our website? I believe. I don't remember, to be honest. Uh, I, if somebody wants to check right now, that would be great because I believe we, we have a number of these plant lists available on our website. Uh, it's not on the gardening resource page. I was okay. actually going to add a list um, on our our store, though. One of the sections I was going to make was an under oak section. So it's not there now, but in the next few days, at least the plants in our store that are reasonably good under oaks will have their own separate section. And I'll bet Grassroots' new book will have a list of that. Yeah, yes, I was just saying that um, if people email me and I'm just nursery at grassrootsecology.org, I can probably grab that list and send it to people before the book's available. Also, uh, the, the, one of the best resources for uh, learning about uh, native plants is the Las Pilitas Nursery website. And they have a page about planting under oaks. I'm going to send you URL in a moment. And I uh, just wanted to say we're actually running a little bit over. And our, the, our store is not going to open until I'm off of this. So I just, um, I think we, we probably do need to wrap up. Maybe take just one, one more question. What do you think, Madeline? Yeah. Yeah, we have okay, three let's... questions left in the Q&A. Okay, um, I'll just real quickly say that in terms of edibles, um, I know quickly, first of all, manzanita and native currants have our native plants that um, with edible fruits. Um, you can look up recipes online for how to use them. Um, 
California grapes. And California grapes, yes. And in the spring, um, Indian lettuce, or you could call it miner's lettuce, but please don't. Claytonia perfoliata is wonderful. Oh, yes. And I also, from my holly leaf cherry, I, when I'm ambitious, make a syrup out of the, um, and California elderberry too, the mm -hmm. Western elderberry. You yep. can, those are, those are other edibles. Yeah, blue elderberry, not red. Red is poisonous. <laughs> Definitely make sure you That's get That's right. It. And then the blue elderberry is poisonous until ripe. Right. 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 Hazelnuts. Wanna... Oh, yeah? yeah? Hazelnuts, if you could grab them from the squirrels. Oh, and thimbleberry. Thimbleberry is yummy. Yeah. And of course, acorns are edible. Strawberries. If, you're, oh, if yeah. you're willing to leach them. And there are books that you can get that go into preparation methods for these for these um, things. I'll, I don't. I have a book. You know, we can we can put some of these things. Um, maybe we should put something on our website about this. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll think yeah. about it. And are we selling anything in the CNPS nursery we haven't sold before? And I have actually been thinking, Patricia. I've been thinking about that question since I read it, and I I have. I just can't think of anything. Melanie, do you? We have, I haven't um, seen the question. Um, something we haven't sold before. Yeah. Oh I, my gosh. Um, I don't think so. This year we've been struggling because we're under COVID regulations. So I don't think there's anything new. That well, the, what about the Areogonum ovalifolium? The, there's. Oh. I, so, We've had that a long time. Yeah, we we haven't sold it recently though, and it's a you know it's a tiny little thing. It's a nice rock garden. Yeah, um, Excellent. Three really good rock garden areogonums this year. There's the righty eye, Kennedy eye, Kennedy. Kennedy eye. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, this ovalifolium that are really cute little guys. I think we have chalk dudleya that's ready. Oh, oh yes. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right, Linda. I forgot you're there. You've been quiet. Hey, you, of all people, you you have any thoughts on what we have that's new or different? Oh, how about the red? We have um, the manzanita, the King's Mountain manzanita, which we have not carried before. Uh huh. I just need to mention that uh, one thing about planting in the mud, I had no luck with certain manzanitas. Most of the manzanitas that do well for me have uh, shiny leaves. The ones with hairy leaves, I can't keep them alive. So maybe I'm doing something wrong or maybe they, this is not the place to plant them. So be very careful with uh, the, the King's Mountain manzanita. That's uh, Arctostaphylos regis montana. So folks, we have one question left before we can finish. Okay. Bill McCormick's question, is that the one you're talking yep. about, Chris? I really don't know the answer to that one. Um, I mean, I, th I think leaves of any tree make a good mulch. I have found in restricted areas that sometimes leaves of trees build up a little bit too much. I, I have to remove some of the oak leaves under my native oaks because um, they'll start smothering my iris that I have growing under them. And, and but that's because they can't spread out. There's fences. Uh, why don't we read it just in case some people don't see it. Um, if we're stuck with non-native street trees, such as red oak, should we leave those trees for habitat, caterpillars, to overwinter even though they're not native? Or, and is it necessary to leave those leaves to protect those trees' roots? So that was the, quest, the full question. I think it's better to leave the leaves. It protects the soil. Yes. I never had any use for leaf rake ever. <laughs> well, I just want to say because I have oaks growing right up against a fence. So the leaves will sometimes get very deep against the fence that I do go through and lower the level so I can grow plants under them because they get high enough to smother plants. 
Now, one way of dealing with it is to run them through a mulcher, even to, let's say with, uh, with a lawnmower, and then put them back after they are chopped into small pieces. And with the leaves I've taken off, we have done that to and then use them as mulch on my vegetable garden. Yep. So I think we're at time. Maybe we should be wrapping it up. Uh, I believe so. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's been really fun having a chance to have some live interaction with you guys. We, we, I can't tell you how much we all miss having our in-person plant sales and having people come by. Well, I think Deanna agrees with me. Just, it's just great to, after we've been growing the plants, to have this op the opportunity to talk to people and share uh, information and answer your questions. So I am actually very grateful that so many of you showed up and had these all these wonderful questions. And I hope uh, we were able to help you with uh, some of the things that you had on your mind. And um, please contact us if you, there's a, actually there's a contact form on our online store and Deanna shared her email address. I know both of us I think are, are more than happy to answer any questions that you have um, as you're shopping or just in general about native plants. So thank you very much for being here today and um, go ahead and start shopping. I'm gonna open up our store and Deanna's already, her store's already up there waiting for everybody to, uh, to start shopping. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.